I'm honored to be here to share a few stories from Taiwan, an island with 23 million people. Last Friday, May 20th, was the first day in office for our new president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. Personally, I'm very happy because I voted for her. The main reason I voted for her is that I live with eight cats and two dogs, and she is a fellow animal lover with similar progressive values. Marriage equality, cultural diversity, aboriginal rights, abolishing capital punishment, and of course, advocating for animal welfare. On a personal level, Dr. Tsai is not married or partnered, so the first family is two cats and three dogs. The best thing about this arrangement is that you cannot bribe them. Well, you can with treats, but they won't change Dr. Tsai's policies for you. From the January election until May, the transition of administration power took four months. It was remarkably civilized and free of partisan fights because the outgoing premier, Simon Zhang, was a Google engineer with no party affiliation. Simon's main contribution was mandating all government ICT systems under 1 million euros to be released as open data, raising Taiwan to the number one spot on the LKFN Global Open Data Index. His successor, the current premier, is also independent. They agreed on a transparent transfer of power with materials from all ministries published online. There are many more non-partisan policy-first politicians in Taiwan today, including the Taipei City Mayor, a medical professor, and the Vice President, a researcher on epidemics who was knighted by the Vatican for contributions during the SARS virus outbreak. So how did we overcome decades of party politics? It all began in March 2014, when students in the Sunflower Movement occupied the parliament for 22 days. At the time, the Taiwan parliament considered trade agreement with Beijing as a domestic affair and refused to discuss it like they do for other international agreements. So the occupiers took over Congress halls and demonstrated their own deliberation process. Hundreds of GovZero hackers built real-time ICT systems for coordinating supplies, live streaming, transcription, and translation broadcasting demonstration to half a million people on the street and millions more online. Why are there so many civic hackers in Taiwan volunteering to work on democracy? I think it's because our generation is the first to speak out freely. Free speech was banned for 40 years during martial law under the Jiang dictatorship. The year 1988 brought freedom of the press and personal computers. The year 1996 brought the first presidential election and dot-com websites. Internet and democracy evolved together, spread together, and integrated with each other. So when we write free software, free as in freedom, we always focus on its social impact. I'm very happy to see La Commission Numérique in Nudibu adopting the tools we worked on during the Sunflower Movement. By the end of 2014, city-level elections brought many occupiers into local governments. On the national level, the new premier reached out to civic hackers to reinvent policymaking. Our first major task was a virtual epidemic that paralyzed many governments across the globe, Uber. Uber is not just one company. It's the host of a spreading meme a virus of the mind known as sharing economy. Governments couldn't do much about it. The Paris city may shut down its local office, but the app just keeps running. In 2014, Taipei City's taxi drivers surrounded the Minister of Transport in protest, demanding negotiation. But memes are like biological virus. How do we negotiate with an epidemic? Jacqueline Tsai then the Minister of Cyberspace Affairs wanted a discussion that involves all stakeholders. Taiwan doesn't have a Commission Nationale du Débat Public, so the Minister joined GovZero hacktivists to invent a deliberative process. Deliberation, thinking deeply about something together, is an effective vaccine against virus of the mind. When everyone 
passengers and drivers, academics and public servants, listen to each other and form a consensus, we become immune to divisive PR campaigns in the future. A proper deliberation involves four stages. First, the facts. What do we know? Second, the feelings. What's our reactions? Third, ideas. What are the possibilities? Finally, the decisions. What can we all agree on? However, if the decision-making process is not transparent, we don't get access to the same facts as the policymakers. And without considering relevant facts and everybody's feelings, ideas become ideologies, virus of the mind, that makes people blind to new facts and to each other's feelings. So our first step is open data, making all the facts available, not just numbers, but also meeting records, studies, analysis. The minister publishes all materials she receives so everybody can be on the same page. Next, we created an interactive survey, placing all participants among groups of people and show one yes or no statement above it. As the participant clicks agree or disagree, their avatar moves toward a group with similar feelings and the next statement shows up. Everyone can contribute to their statements for others to vote on. We invited all stakeholders to the POLIS survey website at the same time to ensure a balanced diversity of participants. Four groups of people soon emerged. Taxi drivers, Uber drivers, Uber passengers, and other passengers. The POLIS system show each group how much their share sentiments are received by other groups encouraging participants to contribute ever more inclusive statements that show up as majority opinions. After four weeks, participants have converged on a coherent set of reflections, expectations, and suggestions, successfully forming a coherent agenda for the stakeholders to respond in public. On May 23, 2016, yes, that's this week, the administration pledged to ratify all the deliberations consensus items into a new regulation. Taxis no longer need to be painted yellow. High-end app-based taxis are free to operate as long as they don't undercut existing meters. Apps must display car and driver identification, estimated fare, and customer rating. Per ride revenue are subject to taxation and audits. Well. While Uber currently resists the last requirement, other Uber-like apps are now entering the market. After Uber, the Airbnb deliberation also went well, with Airbnb sending email to all their Taiwan members, urging them to participate online. Airbnb's founder also visited Taiwan and pledged agreement on all consensus items. Because we're all volunteers working in spare time on this, we rely on free software and automated moderation tools. They have proven to work well under massive scale. However, many national policies face the opposite problem of massive scale. You see, Uber and Airbnb are hot topics, but other public issues such as judicial reform, land use planning, and culture policy won't get much coverage. The long-form explanations won't fit into mainstream TV and newspapers, and there are no angles for sensational commentaries. So, by late 2015, occupiers created new media channels with the same non-profit, open-source, crowd-based techniques from the Sunflower Movement. To the left is The Reporter, a news website focused on investigative journalism on public issues. It received 300,000 euros in donations and 100,000 regular subscribers. To the right is Talk to Taiwan, an interactive web TV show broadcast every Thursday evening, with a guest specializing on one policy area, the mayor of Taipei City on Medicare, the outgoing premier on cyber infrastructure, and this week, the new minister of Kocha. The show's content is crowdsourced, 
Every Monday begins with an interactive survey of audience expectations, followed by infographic briefs and articles. During the show, the guest takes 40 minutes to convey their vision, and 20 minutes on rapid-fire Q&A session with the live chat room, joined by 200,000 viewers to date. The show was filmed in immersive, high-quality 360 video. This reflective space changed the nature of dialogue. Instead of becoming a blurred talking head speaking to an imagined audience behind the camera, guests feel that they have the full attention from the room and focus on getting the ideas across. If they tell a joke, the audience can virtually turn around and see if people in the room are laughing or not. City-level deliberation also blossomed after the Occupy. This February, Tainan City adopted the COP21 Worldwide Views method at the Feiyan New Village, a controversial urban renovation site with escalating conflict between the construction company, archaeologists, ecologists, and local residents. Backed by open data and multi-stakeholder briefings, the deliberation successfully diffused misunderstanding among hundreds of local residents. They agreed on a set of more moderate suggestions to the city. As we become more familiar with facilitated hearings and deliberations, large-scale public projects still pose a challenge. Take airports, for example. It's often one architect's expertise versus the counter-expertise vision. Citizens may trust one architect over the other, but the diagrams and models are often too abstract for people to make informed choices. And with the national policy of open data by default, getting raw measurement published is not a problem. The problem is how to turn them into social objects, around which everyone can make meaningful conversations and contributions. This January, when I visited Paris for a dialogue with Blaise in La Nuit des Idées, we brainstormed on designing a deliberation process in virtual reality, entering architects' visions and interacting with them in real time. The goal is to make it enjoyable to participate in the deliberative process, like watching and acting in a 3D IMAX movie. Today, virtual desktop sharing tools are already there for HTC Vive and Oculus. This September, as the more affordable Daydream headsets arrive, I'll lead a class in the China Academy of Art to explore these tools. Since I'll be in Paris physically at the time, I plan to transmit an animated 3D model of myself to Hangzhou with the entire semester recorded in VR telepresence. Everyone can revisit the virtual classroom in the future and contribute to it. If this works, we will scale out the experiment globally and I can spend more time at home with two dogs and eight cats. Speaking of cats, this is a big cat, the Formosan clouded leopard, that went extinct around the time I was born. Now, Taiwan is a small island, about the same size as the Normandy region, but it hosts 1.5% of the world species and one-tenth of the total marine species on Earth. However, Overexploitation destroyed the habitat of many animals, including the leopard cat picture here. There's less than 500 of them now. Back in April 2013, after the head of parliament agreed to the protesters' demand, the occupiers moved out of parliament, but they didn't go back to their homes. Instead, they surrounded the environmental agency, putting a stop to the road construction that would have made the leopard cats extinct. I remember I was deeply touched at the time of the massive scale of mobilization. But let's admit it, it's because cats are really, really cute. What about stray dogs? What about other species that's not as cute, but equally important for the biosphere? The answer came to me two months ago when I visited Disneyland here in Paris. Most of Disneyland attractions are based on physical hardware, such as roller coasters and falling elevators. There is one exception. The Ruhatatwil virtual reality ride is based on software. For five minutes, I shrunk down to the size of a rat, fell through a roof chased by humans. I remember thinking, this is it. 
Then I found several Minecraft-like virtual reality apps that turns architecture plans into immersive environments with shrink rays built in. So I'll also explore those tools in the September workshop. Many of them are designed for gaming, but we can always turn them into games with a purpose. Actually, we can think of democracy itself as a game with a purpose, with voting as its entry level, equivalent of clicking like on social media. Open data takes it a level further. When all budgets, laws, and statistics have their place on the web, we can share their links together to get a bigger picture. Forums are useful, too. When questions are answered in a timely fashion, it bridges the gap between public servants and the civil society. And then we can have meaningful consultations, where people discuss openly, discover new facts, and sharing each other's feelings. Deliberation takes another level further. When elected officials and private sector companies listen to the public and pledge their commitments in the open, then the public can listen to them, too. And the final level, true agenda-setting power. It can never come from above, because it changed the rule of the game. It only emerges naturally when we are ready to share the purpose of our lives through facts, feelings, and ideas, not ideologies. Splitting the world with ideologies Finding comfort in like-minded communities is too easy nowadays, with social technologies acting as filter bubbles, labor and capital, religion and science, you name it. However, there is a sense that disruptive technologies, machine learning, virtual reality, self-driving cars, compress the communities, forcing violent clashes, is the ultimate clash in the so-called singularity where people lost all agency altogether. If we subscribe to ideologies that define what an individual can do, then of course it makes us terrified when machines do it better, but it doesn't need to be this way. Mathematically, we can resolve many singularities by plotting them with an extra dimension t, making it possible to meet at the origin, listen to each other, meet and listen again and again. Through deliberation, we can build together a plurality among the multitude of people and animals, plants and rivers, and even more importantly, among our own past and future imagination of ourselves. The singularity may be near, but the plurality is here. I'd like to conclude my talk with these words from Dr. Tsai's inauguration speech. She said, Before, democracy was a showdown between two opposing values. Now, democracy is a conversation between many diverse values. To build a united democracy that is not hijacked by ideology. To build an efficient democracy that responds to the society and economy. To build a pragmatic democracy that takes care of the people. Well, this is our experiment in reinventing democracy. Let's all keep listening to each other. Thank you for listening.